Good day, everybody. My name is Deacon Derek Walcott, and I'm inviting you and thanking you for tuning in to Shepherd's Corner, having conversations with Archbishop Charles Jason Gordon. And we're in the beautiful month of September, and that's catechetical month, you know. So what is this thing about catechetical month, teaching the faith, and so on? So, you know, a catechist mandate is to accompany others to God. Now, that's the headliner by Archbishop Charles Jason Gordon. A catechist mandate is to accompany others to God. So let's welcome Archbishop Charles Jason Gordon. Good day, sir. How are you? I'm doing really good, you know, Deacon. The September is always a um, catechetical month. And so we, we, we're hitting into the month looking at the catechist mandate. And what, what is this mandate of the catechist and, and, and how would we to understand catechetics today in our church? Because catechetics is a serious business and, and it, it requires us to refocus, rethink. And I think it needs a new, you know, in Trinidad we might say paradigm, a new paradigm to look at it where we where we see in it now from a from a different perspective from how we have seen it be before. Yeah, because you know, um, it's a new generation. They think differently, they they communicate differently, and we can't use the old methods to pass on the faith. Or maybe, you know, maybe we won't use any right methods in the first place. I don't know, but I'm I'm willing to hear what you have to say on this. Well, you know, there's a biblical verse, you know, new wine, oh, new wine skin. New wine skin. You can't put the new wine into old wine skin. You'll tear the skin and waste the wine. Yeah. And, and we have new wine. It has to be new wine skin. So transmitting the faith to the next generation, I think, is the most urgent task and the most challenging task of the church today. Why? Because... Anybody who knows anything at all knows that this generation is very different from, let's just say, our generation. Mm -hmm. Let's just say. You have children and you have grandchildren. Correct. And you could already see the difference between the children and the grandchildren. And listen, they so far apart is unbelievable. <laughs> mm -hmm. so far apart. How they communicate how they, everything you know, how they think how they think yeah it, it's it's and and you know for for a thousand years or for ten thousand years the world was in an agricultural um society um 1700s industrialization comes and changes the mindset of the world um in the in the last while you know We've gone into a digital age that ch changed the mindset of the world again. Then in the last little while, we've been in the, the technology age where each person now becomes a producer and a consumer of technology. That's changed the mindset of the world again. So we've had some big, big transformational changes over, over the last while, and they've been more rapid. So imagine 10,000 years to settle an agricultural existence, 300 years to settle uh, industrial revolution existence. And, and we haven't had 50, 60 years, and we've had about two major changes in that last 50 to 60 years. And, and it's only getting more rapid. So because of that, we have to understand that the job of transmitting the faith means that we can't do it the way we received it we are not the ones to receive the faith now we we got to receive the faith in a much more stable world and stable environment this generation is in a tumultuous world where things are changing so rapidly and because of that transmitting faith is a is a very different task the faith remains the faith but how we hand it on has to be re-looked at. And, and that's the whole point of, of our conversating today. 
And you know, I, I tell you, you're straight up. I try every single imaginative thing. Man, I will even drop on AI to give me some 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 sort of insight into understanding how they think and how we could transmit this feed. To me, I have to use every weapon, every tool at our disposal. Up to now, I have not found the adequate response to this great challenge of transmitting faith to this, to this generation. But I would say there are many in this generation who have received the faith. And, I, I, you know, it's hit and miss for me in understanding it. I see people come from, from families I consider really good Catholic families, mom and dad practicing, mom and dad involved in the parish, involved in the ministry, mom and, mom and dad pray um, every day as a family, all the time growing up. And as young adults, um, the young adults feel that the Catholic Church has done them this big bad wrong. And I, 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 I don't understand what it was. I, I really don't. And, and, and the anger is not just that I left because I'm a little bit lazy, which was more my generation. This is a left because of X. And what? At, at what? It's, it's unclear to me. But what I do know is that it is a, um, it is an uphill battle that requires a real angst with God so that we, we really um, start understanding what it is we, we're doing and, and how, we, how we move in this. From, so from my perspective, you know, there are many, many challenges that we're facing in this, in this matter. Yeah, but my, my, the, the, the thing is, boy, um, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like as old people, we have to rewire our brain <laughs> to, be yeah. able to, to be able to have them, you know, even listen to what, what we are saying, you know, in terms of how we communicate with them. And you know, yes. communications is the key. You know, I, I think the front. is the key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, here's the big challenges. Huh? The first is that Catholics are not having as many children, and many Catholics no longer go to church on a Sunday. So that that is this. Yeah. All yeah. right. When when you have a society where you have a pyramid, where the oldest group is the big is the smallest group. And the youngest group is the largest. Group. That's a right. stable society. But when Catholics, and generally in Trinidad, we fall to 1.6 of the birth rate, which means we are in an inverted pyramid birth rate. Yeah. So we're having fewer and fewer children, fewer and fewer children being born to Catholics. There are fewer and fewer Catholics getting married. So that that brings this 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 inverted um, pyramid. More, more sharply so. But then, even of the Catholics that are existing, fewer of them by percentage are turning up to church on a Sunday. So yeah, you, yeah, you, have, you yeah. have both, you have attrition on two different levels. Yeah. So, I, and I think the reason for this is manifold. I do that. It's not, um, I, I've seen statistics that suggest that this is, this is so of, of of most of the major religions right now. Uh, uh, Not just uh, Christian, uh, Christian faiths, but most of the major religions are having similar challenges with, with their, their children adhering to the faith. And listen to me, COVID did not help. I'm just saying, no, 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 no. COVID did not help. COVID stepped it back a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It, it stepped it back a little bit. But I believe in part that these, these Catholics do not have a living faith. Those who are not coming to mass regularly, they, they have a cultural Catholicism, not so a living they, faith in Jesus Christ. A living faith. Now, I, I want you to define that. You're saying that they were more culturally minded in terms of their mm -hmm. faith rather than have a relationship, a, a good relationship with the living Christ. So somebody who has a living faith is praying every day. Yeah, oh, they have a routine of their prayer. Not only they're praying every day, there's a routine inside of their prayer. Right. Not only is there a routine inside of their prayer, but they are also doing 
um, studying of their tradition. And not only is their routine, they're studying the tradition, they're also working to, to um, be more generous in what they have. Not only are they more generous, they're ready to participate onto others. Now, I'm gonna throw some, I'm, I'm throwing a, a curveball here too, or maybe it's a China man. So out of those that we are seeing that are coming to church, I mean, I, I, I just throw it out of figure there. Yeah. Of the baptized Catholics, let me just say 11%. Let me just say 11%, right? How much of that 11% how do you think have a living faith? Well, Matthew Kelly did a survey on this in the States, and he came up with 7%. 7%? 7 percent. <laughs> percent of Catholics have a, a living what faith. he will call a dynamic Catholic, I'll call a living faith missionary disciple whatever term you want wow. is seven percent wow 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 and, and, and that's that, what, that is that, 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 that's that, that's what you were just explaining of this these catholics yeah have a routine of prayer who have yes uh, uh, they they're study, educating themselves they, they, they're using their their time on tiktok and and on social media and facebook yeah. To, to learn more about the faith. Wow. So people and, outside... And they're, the... reading, they're reading Catholic books. They're looking at Catholic authors. They're studying um, Christianity on a, on a regular basis. So, so that's, that's the... Um, Matthew Kelly wrote his Four Signs of a Dynamic Catholic. Right. And we gave that book away. There's one sitting down in a living room, living room near you somewhere. Hey, right on the shelf there. <laughs> somewhere. Dust it off. Go back and check it and you'll see. This is, this is a study he did yeah. all across America. And when the team was looking through the data, they didn't know what they were looking for. And they realized that there was this, these Catholics that were really committed. They said, well, what's, what's with them? What do they have in common? And went back to them and said, well, tell us what you do. And they, the four things that they had in common were these four signs. But it's Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayer. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's the same, it's the same yeah. um, thing that, that there's a devotion that you do when you have a relationship, a living faith in Jesus Christ. Wow, you know, I was watching a TikTok. I think it was today. I'll, I'll share it with you. Where this priest, I think it was a priest, and he was talking on, on this TikTok about if you read Holy Scriptures, you're studying. So you're studying your faith yeah. one day a week. This is basically how it goes. Two days a week. Three days a week. If you study Scripture and read Scripture four days a week, the spike goes way up in the air. Way right. up in the air in five two, days a week, yeah, off the chart, off the chart, and it was amazing. And these are yeah. people, um, but you're always sharing with us, you know, hey guys, in the Catholic news, you have your daily yeah. readings, we have Correct. more 60, Correct. you know, your, Correct. Partner, your partner was in, in the chapel today at midday to help out, and I just like you know. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, what we need to do is really understand what it is we need to pass on. Okay. It's not cultural Catholicism. It is a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. What needs to be passed on is a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. Not the cultural pieces. That, that, that comes and goes. But above all, we absolutely need to pass on faith. That's what we absolutely need to pass on. Knowledge is important, you know. Don't get me wrong but it's not a substitute for faith. And many times the catechetical mandate is seen as passing on the knowledge, the knowledge, the knowledge, the knowledge. of the faith. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who made you, God made you. And not the living faith, which then really orients the person mm -hmm. towards Christ and therefore to the knowledge that they need to know, love, and serve this God. Wow, it is a there's a tough ask, but it's a tough ask. Um, in terms of how we have to rethink transmitting the faith. What I'm hearing 
from you is that you know in 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 the in the in, in the in the past it was all about transferring knowledge rather than having someone have an encounter with Christ and a, a deepening of the faith experience mm -hmm. am i am i getting this thing right yeah you're hearing this absolutely right i would dare i'd go so far as to say is we if we pass on all the knowledge that would be religious studies <laughs> When you pass on, pass on the living faith, wow, wow. that becomes that becomes a different beast. And, and a lot of our catechetical venture is into what I would call religious studies, where nearly comparative religion, right, where right. you're studying about yeah, this yeah. phenomena called religion and right. what these peculiar people, Catholics, what they actually believe right. and why they believe it. But that is that is far short from an encounter with Jesus Christ that blows your socks off and, and, and puts you in touch with Christ in a way where Christ starts working in your soul and bringing you to new places with him. Wow. You know, but, but you had to have it to be able to pass it on. Eh? So I, well, I just say, I just say you have to have it to pass it on. And that's the catechetical mandate. Mandate. If you don't have it, you can't pass it on. If you don't have it, there's nothing, you know, nothing you can do but give knowledge. Yeah. So if you don't have a living faith yourself, then what you're handing on is the knowledge of the faith. And that that is easy to do because we have plenty of books where we could find all the key doctrines and, and pass the doctrines on. And people will come to a reasonable understanding about the doctrines of the church. That is short of a living faith. So That's short of a living faith. I, I see in your in your article you're talking about the primacy of faith. Yep. The catechism defines faith in this way. Mm -hmm. Faith is first of all a personal adherence of man to God. You hear that one? A first of all, <laughs> first of all, a personal adherence of man to God. At the same time, and inseparably, it is a free ascent to the whole truth that God has revealed. As personal adherence to God and ascent to his truth, Christian faith differs from our faith in any human person. So it's a personal adherence, a free ascent to the truth. Now, if you try to convey the truth without the personal adherence, you fall way, 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 way short. Yeah, yeah. If you try to convey the personal adherence without, without the truth, yeah, truth, you will also fall way short. But the primacy is in, in the passing on the personal adherence of man to God. Because that's the docility of heart. That's the humility before God. That is the recognition of our need. That is all the things that dispose us to that relationship with the divine, recognizing that God is completely other than we are puny minds. When you know you have a problem, we have a problem in this technological age because that understanding of the primacy of Almighty God, you talk about something humble, you know, bend my heart before the Lord. 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 This humility mm -hmm. is not something that is taught by the world. No, 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 no. But it is, it is really, that's, that's really the, the, the heart of it. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that it's these two dimensions, yeah. personal adherence, ascent to the whole truth that God has revealed. And, and, and many times people want to do the a la carte thing. I believe this and that and that, but these what? others, no, no, I'm not in that. No, that doesn't work either. Ascent to the whole truth that God has revealed for yeah. us. Yeah. 
and and so it, it it really calls for a docility of heart, a humility, but a, a curious mind, a really curious mind. I think having that curious mind comes from understanding of the supreme being. You see, once once you, you, you have that understanding that there is this supreme being that is greater mm -hmm. than any knowledge you think you can have, then you... The, you, the key word is supreme. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The key, the key, let, let, let's just pause on the key word as supreme being. That means a being that is completely other than. Yes. Completely above than completely everything we could think of but but it's that's what we're holding on so faith is both adherence to god and assent to truth, assent to truth. yeah and you know what did it in hey. paradoxical 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 because the it's holding two things yeah and, and very often in the catechetical task, we put one forward, the, the ascent to the truth. But the ascent to the truth, you know, is like having an engine with no, with no gasoline in it. <laughs> you ain't going anywhere. <laughs> you, you crank it all you want to crank it. It just can't fire. It can't fire. All the parts are there, you know. All the pieces are there. We just got fire. It, it needs that ignition to, to, to really open the mind and allow that light bulb to go up that there is a God and this God loves you and you are special in God's eyes. And, and that's the beginning of passing faith to the, to the next generation. And, and that's why faith is not just propositional, nor is it only relationship or relational. It is both relational and um, propositional at the same time. Boy, there's a paradox both. again, boy. You have a paradox both. there, boy. <laughs> For many years, we have put the propositions as primary. Yeah. And we've had the primacy of the power of the of the propositions. I I mean, I remember going, who made you? God made you. Why did God make you? God, God made me to love him, love him serve him, and, him and be with him in this world and, and happy, happy in this world and happy with him forever in the next. Yes, yeah. and, and we went back through these question and answers. And, and there's something about that that is important. But that is not the faith. That's not the faith. That's the beliefs that we believe. The faith is personal adherence to God and how, how we dispose ourselves to that. So the challenge here is how did you get here? How did I get here? That's the All big right. challenge, you know. And how, yeah. do we pass on, how do we pass on that same thing to those that we encounter? That I scratched my head with. <laughs> that, that's it. That's it. You know... When we, when we understand both the relational and the propositional, then we start to understand, oh, so the person has to have a relationship with Christ, but they must also know. Without the relationship, the knowledge becomes just an inquiry. With the relationship, the, the knowledge gets ignited and, and goes to, to new places. People have a, a living relationship and a living faith in, in God. Um, they, they actually are self-learners. They learn so much about the faith every day. Right. That, that, that's what, what you, you want to see. So, yeah, I, I, I reading your article, you know, we have produced many generations who know what the church taught, but do not have a living faith which requires first a personal adherence to God, a personal adherence to God. A, a relationship, relationship of love and I, trust yeah. with Christ. Yeah. And this is knowledge in the biblical sense of the word. Eh? <laughs> Explain this. Knowledge in the biblical sense. Give me, give, 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 yeah. give me, give me that. 
Adam knew Eve oh, and she conceived a son. Genesis. For the for the the, the mind of, of yes. the Old Testament, knowledge is not an intellectual wow. an intellectual pursuit or proposition. Knowledge is is with the whole of who I am. And a living faith is with the whole of who I am. Body, mind, soul, and spirit. With all of who I am. Adam didn't know Eve with his brain and she conceived a son. Eh? <laughs> Boy. Wow. The, he, is... he knew Eve with everything yes, of who yes, he is. Yes, yes, yes. And she conceived a son. So knowledge here is is the most intense form of inti intimacy that the human engage in in their whole being. Adam gave all of himself to Eve. It was the whole being that must be given to God. All of us must be given to God. Not just my brain or my, my intellect or my heart or my will or my emotions or my desires. All of who I am is who must be given back to God. All of who I am. Yeah, yeah, I'm pausing here, boy. You know, how 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 can we give our all to God? You know, um as you see, okay, I can study all scripture, theology, and all of that kind of thing, but that might be just this the knowledge, you know, the knowledge yes. side. You had to give yeah, you had to do this. Okay. Heart yeah. and and mind. Yeah, yeah. Emotions. And body. Everything. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Adam knew, knew Eve. Eve. Adam. You know, and the old time catechism. Yeah. Why did God make you? To know him. To love God him. God made me to, to know him, to him, love him, and to, to serve him. 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 And in this world and be happy with him forever in the next. next yeah. That's the whole of myself being given over to God. The whole of me, not only in this world, but also in the next. To know him, to know him in the way that Adam knew Eve, with complete intimacy and self-giving. Love him in the way Adam knew Eve. Serve him in the way Adam knew Eve. So the Adam-Eve relationship, which is a nuptial union between husband and wife, is how Hosea understands the relationship between God and his people. That's the understanding of the Last Supper and of the Eucharist. The Eucharist is always seen as the wedding feast of the bride and the groom, which is the Lamb of God. And that, that nuptial union of bride and groom is, is, the, is really the prototype of the spiritual life because what is the spiritual life? This nuptial union of the soul and God. Which, and that's why adherence to God with everything and the propositions of faith, adherence to that. You know, I'm, I'm just hearing an echo. Theology of the body. I'm hearing Benedict XVI. I'm hearing Pope Francis, you know, all these three yes. popes are speaking the same language, are speaking this language of yes. intimacy. Yes, yes, yes. But, you know, at the heart of faith is radical, extreme intimacy. Wow. And this is what people are not getting. They believe at the heart of faith is obedience. No, 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 no. At the heart of faith is radical, extreme intimacy with God. And, and, and what do people feel, feel the most unloved and alienated from other people? And what is God offering you? Intimacy and nuptial union with him. So God really has the healing balm for the worst ailment of our, of our day which is alienation, isolation, loneliness, feeling 
alone and cut off from others. You see, but, but intimacy calls for complete trust. Intimacy yes. calls for vulnerability. Intimacy Correct. calls Correct. for those things. And our modern world has us running from intimacy, even in the relationships. That's why I said earlier on, many young people don't want to get married. Mm -hmm. They're yes. running away from this from intimacy. The intimacy. Into me. And, and, <laughs> and when they run from the intimacy, what they run into is a lifestyle and ultimately loneliness. Yeah. Hollowness and emptiness. Ultimately. So when we come to faith, we come to a love that is beyond all human imagination. You know, when you get it, you're God smart, you're total big. Mm. Yeah. Well, well, when you come to faith in Christ, you're total big. You, 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 you just, you are, you are just, don't believe that you could be so fortunate to be loved so deeply Amen. by a God Amen. who is so grand that could take such care for puny little mind that is you, that, that you just, you're just completely blown away. It consumes all of us. And we desire to give all of who we are back to this God yeah. who fills us with utter fullness of Christ. So how do we transmit this thing? Because, you know, these words that you have transcribed onto, by the way, people, the Catholic news, pick it up. By your Catholic news. By your Catholic news. Okay, so so I'm hearing you, I'm listening to you. How do we get our young people? How, as catechists, because we're dealing with the catechists, their mandate, a company, oh Lord, I like the word, the word is accompany others to God. That's the mandate. How do we get this? The how as catechists do we get to help others accompany others to God? That's the question. That's like my million dollar question. We gain there. We gain there. <laughs> Here's what St. Paul says: that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how high, how wide, how long, how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the utter fullness of God. That is, that, that's what faith in its completeness looks like, that you will be filled to the fullness of to the utter fullness of God. You know, how high, how deep, how wide, how long is this love of God? And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge. Knowledge ends. And the love <coughs> continues on. The knowledge could take us to a certain place. Yeah. But to, to fire up that engine, it, it, it has to fire through love. And the personal adherence is about loving God with everything that you have. Loving your neighbors yourself. So really, it's a response of love. On, on Saturday, I celebrated Mass with the, um, the, the Catechist of the Northern Vicariate. And the, the reading given to me was from Thessalonians, um, from 1 Thessalonians. And I, I took the reading and it intrigued me because it spoke about the catechetical mandate. Any reading, as, as for loving our brothers, there's no need for anyone to write to you about that. Since you have learned from God yourselves to love one another. And in fact, this is what you are doing with all the brothers throughout the whole of Macedonia. However, we do urge you brothers to go on making every greater progress and to make a point of living quietly, attending your own business and earning your living just as we told you to. So what is Paul really saying here? The primary point of the, of the this is really powerful text is that love 
is the response to faith. Love. Love is the response, response to, faith. to faith. Yeah. As for loving our brothers, there's no need for anyone to say anything. Love is the response to faith. And the second point is, if we have faith in God, then we will love God and we will love our brothers and sisters. See, primacy of faith right there, you know? The primacy yep. of faith right there, you know? If you have faith, you will love God and you will love your brothers and sisters. Paul is reaffirming Jesus' command. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So must you love one another. So must you love one another. You know, in a recent synod, in a recent meeting of the synod in Bogota, Colombia, a small group spoke about the first theme, which is on, on communion. And the group realized that communion is indispensable in the church. It is the first thing that we are always working on, no matter what else you're working on, you always have to be working on communion. There's no communion or love. There's no ministry or mission without sacrifice. And where there's no love, there's no mission. Where there's no communion, there's no church. It's real simple. By the fruit, you're going to know them. And, and if what you find is tearing down and, and, and it belittling, et cetera, et cetera, then, then that is not, that's not a fruit of the church not a fruit of the church. So the Thessalonians were praised for their love and charity among themselves and, and to the other churches because they, they gave a big collection when they were collecting for Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. But whatever we do in the church, we have to do it in love. Love is the only key that we, we sing in from. It has to be done in love. The whole experience of catechesis needs to be the, the one of love and a teaching the skills of being loving and hospitable. When you're talking about skills, skills mm -hmm. of being loving and hospitable. and hospitable. Yes. Because not everybody knows how to love. Well, you had an experience. Oh, oh Lord, you remember what you said earlier on. You know, you I mean, can't if, give if, away if, what you do have. You cannot precisely. But not everybody knows how to love. Not everybody knows how. And, and so we have to help people to learn how. We have to help people to become better lovers. Hey, I remember in a former teaching, you said, remember love is a verb, not a noun. <laughs> Correct. Correct. It's an action word. Yes. Yes. Now, now, this is also the mandate for the transformation of the whole parish and of every ministry. It has to be about love. It has to be about building communion. It has to be about people coming together and feeling that love of each other as they're loving Jesus Christ. But there's a surprising twist in the text, you know, because in the beginning of the same text, of St. Paul, he teaches that they will all be taught by God. They were all taught by God. He saw the transformation of the community and recognized it as a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah and, and of, of the other prophets who prophesied, all your children shall be taught by God. Yes. Isaiah 54, yes. Yes. 13. Yes. Or Jeremiah foresees a new covenant where God will write the law of the people in, in, in their hearts. Right. Right. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. If St. Paul is right, that we learn from God, then what is the catechistas? He prays the Thessalonians, um, for, I know that, that God, you are all taught by God, he said. And if that is true, that we are all taught by God, then what is the catechistas? 
I think that this is vital for our inquiry. Because if, if you have God as your teacher, what, what again you want? Okay. He says, I'm the way. I'm the way. The truth. What again you want? Okay. What again you want? The catechist task is to accompany others to the encounter with God. Yes. So they begin to have a living faith. We can't give anybody faith. Faith is a free gift given by God and God alone. It is God who gives faith. But we can put people in touch with God where God could ignite their faith. I hear you know, we have to put people in touch with God. Yeah. And he will and do the rest. And allow God to ignite their faith. You have to put want, people in touch with God, and God is the one who will ignite their faith. I hear you. Many times we think we can yes. faith to the next generation. Yes. That's God's work. My work is to put you in touch with God. And allow God to do God's business. Yes. I see where I have failed. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Because you, 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 you just, you know, you're making a little paradigm shift there. You know? That's a little paradigm shift there for A me. big one. You know what I mean? Because when we think we have to hand the faith on to people, we want the program to go longer and longer and longer. Yeah. When we understand is God who has uh, given the spark of faith to people, then we we look at it differently. Yeah. We look at it differently. If 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 the person is put in touch with God and God starts instructing their soul, you can't get a better teacher than that. Can't get a better teacher. But that means the person has to connect with God and God then instructs the soul of that person. That, that's, We're all being taught by God. Yeah, and that, that, that's where, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we hear so many times, let go, boy, and let God. Let go and let God. Yeah. We, we, like, we like control, you see. We are control well, freaks. That's half the challenge. That's half the challenge. So the, the, if, if we are all taught by God, what is the catechist task? The catechist task is the fire of the religious imagination so that that person comes to an encounter with the living Christ. And, and all we could do is set the stage for that. And if we set the stage, something will fire up. Because that's what God does best. That's what God does best. And if we, if we understand that, then the role of the catechist is not to hand on the faith, but it is to put that person in touch with God so that God could fire faith in that person's soul and then the catechist becomes guide on the side, pointing them to how to mature, how to, to nurture, protect, and mature this fragile, fledgling faith that they now have, that they've received. If you read the article, you will see Archbishop's words say this clearly. We cannot give faith. It is God who does it. Yeah, we cannot give faith. And many times, you know, we forget it's a gift from God. It is a gift from God, freely given, which we must pray for. And that's why it needs adherence to God. Yeah. So the master is, well, one of them, and you know, Teresa of Avila. She speaks of four stages of the spiritual life. The first stage is the most difficult. And she likens this stage to drawing water from a well to water a large garden. 
It requires a lot of work. There are many distractions, disruptions, memories of the past deeds, and, and it's a difficult stage in the journey. Imagine you're dropping a, a bucket down, filling it up, pulling it back up, walking, and train some water. And you're doing that until your garden gets well watered. That's, that's labor. That's real labor. And, and that's hold on, she says a large garden. Eh? She says a, yeah, a, yeah. not a garden no, like no, mine, no. you know, partner. No, not no, a no, garden no, like no. That. It's not, a large garden. Not a micro garden. <laughs> but, but, but think of the image. You're drawing it, you're walking, you're wetting. You're drawing, walking, wetting. Drawing, water, walking, wetting. And, and then with all the disruptions and everything that comes, it's, it's a difficult task. The catechist task is to accompany the person through this stage until they have a consistent habit of prayer, until that person is well in touch with God. And until they have a consistent habit of prayer. This re requires giving them a knowledge of God that makes the journey reasonable, but it gives it more than that. It also requires that we give them an encounter with Christ that fires up the religious imagination. And all we could do is, is bring the person, is Christ who gives the encounter. Two things jump out at me there. The word accompany. It is, is, is you know, to accompany the catechist role is yeah. to accompany, you know. Yeah. And and I'm I'm hearing synod somewhere in the back there, you know, the journey. Yeah. The journey. Yeah. All this journeying together. Yeah. Journeying together. The second stage of the journey for St. Teresa of Avila, she likens the water wheel where the person collects the water from the wheel and then goes and waters the garden. So not as much labor because you have to drop your rope, pull up your rope, and then go. You just stick your, your bucket under the, the water and wheel, get it filled up, and then go out and dash water and wet your plants. So that's it. That's it. The second stage of the of the garden. It has work, but by this stage, the soul is being disposed to God. By this stage, the the rebellion and the resistance to God is melting a little bit. <clears throat> by this stage, there's a personal adherence. It is starting to begin between the person and God. No, I, I can understand why the first stage is so challenging. Yeah. You know, because you have all yeah. those distractions. Yeah. So you need the constant labor. And, and you know, John Cassian said, when you sit down to pray, sometimes there's like a thousand monkeys jumping up and down in your head, clam all clamoring for attention at the same time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And nothing had changed. Yeah. But... The, that's why you have to accompany, accompany, accompany through the first phase. Yeah. When they have a relationship with God, when their prayer becomes something that is consistent, when, when their prayer becomes something that they're looking forward to, that person and Christ, they do real good. Now you get them to make sure that they're studying, they make sure that they, they, they remain focused, to make sure the generosity and the evangelization, and and you you you're really good to go. That's a, really good to go. That's a huge. Huh? That's a huge par paradigm change here. Well, and that's why. That's why I'm I'm proposing that the accompaniment mm, yeah. in the first phase is vital. Yeah. And and if you have somebody for a year or two of catechetical formation. What we should do is the first phase really well. Amen. Amen. So by the time they finish whatever whatever we're doing with them, they have come to the next stage and their mm. soul is now right. starting to yearn for God. Right. right. And, and starting to be disposed to the prayer that God is drawing them to. And I'm, I'm thinking of the application of this for your confirmation people, yes, your RCIA people, 
you, all the all the it should be alpha. It yeah. should be um life in the life spirit. In the spirit. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It yeah, should yeah. be all the all um all the encounters so that the person's wow. soul becomes in in engaged in a relationship with God. And then you should be working with their prayer life. The whole first year. Wow. Over and over again, working with them as, as praying beings until they get come to a consistent place where their prayer life is part and parcel of who they are. And that they and you teach them how to pray so they're not only uh, spending time but understanding the prayer. So we bring them into in that also. I need you to say that again. I need you to say that again because you know that that is so criti critical. You know, and we had a little we had a little glitch there. So I want I want you to say that again in terms of that accompanying, you know. You have to accompany the, the person yeah. so that they are in touch with Christ. Yes. So they have a living relationship with Christ. So that they build up their their prayer relationship yeah. that becomes a consistent habit and foundation of their living. And then when they come to their second stage with less work, they could be much more self-motivated, much more self-directed. But in the first stage where the work is so heavy, they really need a guide on the side to help them. You know, and what we've been doing is drilling them with knowledge. Yeah. As opposed to allowing them to, to, to come to that encounter with the living God. So attraction to God starts to grow at the end or during this first and second stage. And, and conversion is being beginning to take root. Yeah. And so the thing is starting to, to move forward. If we go to the third stage, it's like having a, a garden hose. You know, you're just walking around, walking around, enjoying the, the beauty of your garden, wetting your plants, smelling the earth, and, and enjoying the moist that is coming from wetting your plants and giving you this, this wonderful sense of, 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 of God's love. So the, the prayer now becomes rather than the, the first prayer might seem busy and distracting. By the third stage, the prayer is becoming settled and enjoyable. And God is working in the soul and attracting the soul in, in new ways. But it is it is now much more available than it was in the in the first two phases here. And there's now an attraction to God that is compelling. When, when Jeremiah said, you have seduced me, Harry. Do it as stupid and foolish as I am. I allowed myself to be seduced by you. That, that speaks of that depth of, of passionate relationship with God. So in this, in this third stage, the watering is much easier. And the, the prayer is lighter. The distractions are now less. And the soul is now being fed by God. And it is here that you can start to talk about um, God feeding the soul of the human being. In this, in this third stage. And in the final stage, God sends rain to water the God. So the soul becomes passive. And God is now active in drawing the soul to God. He is the one now doing the watering of the garden. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. God is now the active participant. And this is the contemplative stage where, where God is the active con con participant mm -hmm. and, and the soul is now the passive recip recipient of the grace of God. So the hardest stage is the first stage now left to me. Yeah. I don't make I don't make the first stage really. <laughs> I had a proper marketing campaign to attract human beings to want to do the writing. For whatever motive they might have, come and do the writing. 
but not God. You can't have God except on God's terms. And so the first stage is much harder than the other two stages. So it, it takes a lot more to get the person through the first stage. If you have to do anything at all, you accompany the person through that first stage. You help them through it. Matthew Kelly explored this movement in the four signs of a dynamic Catholic. We need to give the person the right balance of witness, encounter, knowledge, so they evolve to the place where they're being taught by God. The ultimate end of all discipleship is that we are all taught by God. That, that's, that's the ultimate end. And to come to that stage, you have to get through the busyness of the prayer, the, the, the difficulty of the, of the burden of prayer. And, and come to the place where you're watering the garden with some ease, either with your bucket from a, wheel, uh, a water wheel or, or because yeah. God gave you the hose yeah. and you're, you're, you're just wetting, wetting the plants all over. God is always a greening power. You know, Matthew Kelly has really been insightful in terms of his books. And, you know, I, I only hope that the, the Archdiocese of Port of Spain has seen the treasure, the treasure that we've yeah. received, you know, through these yes. books by Matthew Kelly. Yeah. It's not just on your bookshelf. The, the, no. So the, the, the thing is, if we would read the spiritual books every year, your journey would catapult up, upwards. Yeah. Take up catechism in a year or take up Bible in a year, your, your journey yes. is yes. going upwards. Attend Mass every every Sunday, your journey. Follow on on, on during the week Mass, you know. Um, come if you can. And if you can't come during the week, well, follow on on, on it. Make it another time of prayer with the rosary after it. And, and and adoration. But but these are the moments of, of grace that we've been receiving to be able to deepen deepen the relationship. And 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 that deepening of the relationship is what is most vital. Most most vital. Give so me a key, key message. message. Key message. Key message. The catechist mandate is to accompany others to God to initiate them in the sacred mysteries where they encounter Christ. It is Christ who teaches and transforms each soul. That's a key message. That's a key message. Yeah. yeah. What's but the action he... step? Ask Christ to move you to the next stage of your journey with him. Where are you? Well, if... If the prayer is just busy and, and difficult and troublesome, and then, then you know where you are. You're in that first stage. Just say, okay, it's going to be a little bit of hard work. Hard work. But there's no communion without sacrifice. Yeah. There's no communion without sacrifice. You know, I've, I've, I've said in a talk recently, and people got all kind of um, flurried on it, that... The Holy Spirit is a very noble, precious, and, and very prudent lady. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't come in in a three-minute rush and get the goodies of her gifts and her talents given back to you. You, gotta, you have to do the things the right way. Yeah. And, and, and that means that you have to, to, to do it in the old time way. You have to spend the time. You have to be there. You have to turn up on the same day, same time every day. You, you have to just put in it. You just, you just keep putting in your time. Keep putting in your time. And one day you will be shocked at what she has done for you. One day. The whole thing lights up. And, and, and what seemed dull, dreary, and, and difficult now becomes enticing and, and exciting and drawing you in. 
that's that's when you fired up and when the relationship has now picked up and moved from your work to the grace that God is giving to help you to live the, the, the life that you, he's called you to. Ask God to show you how to move from the stage you're in, to show you which stage you're in, and to move from that stage of the journey to the next stage with him. And find a copy of the Four Signs of a Dynamic Cat. Think, read it again. It's a really good, good book. Read it again. What's the scripture reading? Scripture reading is now about your love for one another. Thessalonians now. 4911. <laughs> we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by, by God Amen. to love one another. And in fact, you do not, you do love all God's families throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody else, but God and God alone. Archbishop G, I hope everybody watch this those who are in ministry remember the four signs of a dynamic catholic egg pull it off the shelf remember only seven percent of us pulling weight right and therefore get involved get involved in ministry it's so important it, it's for your own benefit also right so say a little prayer with us archbishop g father we thank you for your love we pray oh god Fire up our heart, our life, to love you more. Yes, Teach us, oh God, to go through the, the burdens and the drudgery that sometimes we think prayer is knowing, Lord, that when you find that pool of great price, you sell everything and purchase this one pool. Help us, Lord, to see the value of this life that you have given to us and to desire it more than anything else. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Archbishop J. Remember, everybody, pick up your Catholic news. A catechist mandate. Accompany others to God. God bless you. God bless you. Catechetical month, everybody. September. Get involved. Yes. God bless you. Thank you God again, bless. Archbishop J. Okay. Bye.